Hey, everybody, welcome back to Too Many Men. My voice is barely hanging on, but my name is Allison Lucan, um, and I am here with the stunningly beautiful and about to be even more stunningly beautiful because I can't wait to see pictures from where I know she's going this weekend, but we'll keep that between oh. ourselves. <laughs> and that is going to your dad's S- house. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Sarah Sivian. Sarah, how are you today? I am good. Oh my God. The weather's amazing in Boston. We're getting over the Bruins loss and looking forward to the ECF. That's right. That's right. And we, of course, would not be too many men if we did not have the instigator of the real truth behind why ESPN (laughs) will not show a hockey game at a relevant time. Shana Goldman. Shana, say hi. Hi. Excellent. Well, let's talk about that real quick. So if you weren't paying attention, many of us were confounded. Um, this is this is without a segment. We're just going to go into it. We, many of us were confounded. Yesterday being Mother's Day, there was one NHL game scheduled. It was Edmonton, Vegas. Vegas having the chance to win the series. And shockingly, this game is scheduled to start at 7 p.m. Pacific on a day when there was no other conflicting major sporting event earlier. And it was the only NHL game. And it was a Sunday. So when you put it late on a Sunday, a ton of people are going to have to go to sleep for school or work or what have you. And then things started to come out that perhaps ESPN has contracts that require them to show Major League Baseball on their primary channels and this and that and the other thing. But regardless, it severely hurt what turned out to be a series deciding game. We'll get into the specifics of the series later. But Sarah, as we saw this go down and saw pieces of information start to come out, even former players complaining, what are your thoughts on this whole situation? It's just like, I stay up all night and when I'm tired and not really looking forward to it, it's just kind of like, what are we doing? And I think we'll get into the reporting on this, but there were some things that just weren't true. And then everybody wants to jump to a conclusion. And it's kind of just, it goes to show that if you want good PR uh, around your station or your league, you should come and be up front about what's going on, right? Explain why this is happening. So nobody has to speculate and get things wrong or make you look even worse. It was just kind of like, I know there are reasons, there was like a speculation that they tried to trade it with TNT, which isn't true. And it's just kind of like, no matter the reason for it, it was pretty pathetic why it happened. And I don't know why, I don't know, maybe Shana can get into this because she wrote about it, but it was just really stupid. And we don't, we don't know the why for sure to your point, Sarah, which is insane. But Shana, what you wrote about too, is just talk about the impact on, you know, we, on this podcast, let's be fair here. We complain all the time that women's sports doesn't get the platform that it needs. Here was a really important game with some of the best talent in the NHL right now. And it's going on at a time of day when a large part of North America is going to sleep. So what is the harm happening here to the game itself when this is the scheduling decision that's made? Yeah. So to be clear, because it was mentioned, I saw like some saying they didn't know this was going to be the only game. By the time they came up with the game time, I believe it was Saturday afternoon. I checked my email and I see Saturday at noon. So we already knew that the Maple Leafs were not playing the Florida Panthers. This was not the late game. This was the only game. The problem with it is on a Sunday, generally speaking, in the regular season, games don't happen at 7 p.m. local time. They happen earlier in the day. It's well, it very was local rare time for me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, right. But you, but the game wasn't even in your time zone. And that's what people forget, too. They're like, but the Vegas Golden Knights are in Pacific time. This was in Edmonton. So it's, it's even more perplexing that you're going to have a very late game on a Sunday at 8 o'clock when last week you had the game at 7 p.m. Eastern, which was 4 p.m. Pacific time it was a really odd decision on a Saturday night on a Friday Saturday people are more willing to stay up and on a Sunday it's a school night it's a work night fans wanting to go to the game kids wanting to go to the game might not be able to because they can't stay up people who want to stay up on the east coast you know it's not all about the east coast but if you're growing the game and the league feels that you have to if you're not the league doesn't market the game right they don't market the game they think the game's going to market itself you would think the two best players in the league leon jerry seidel our friend and Connor mcdavid our actual other friend too who knew Mm. playing on the national stage in in a potential elimination game is what you want right that is your showcase it didn't get that and it sucks for the league in a way but it's like it's their fault Because at the end of the day, ESPN, it does seem like ESPN got to choose the time slot and they chose the slot because they had other priorities. The NBA was on the game seven at three 30 
And after that, it's Sunday night baseball at 7 p.m. Eastern. That is the schedule. They could have gone against themselves at seven o'clock on ESPN two. They could have given the game to Turner. Sure. Why would they do it? The best solution for them is to have live programming on their main station, ESPN all day, which is what they yeah. got. 337, 10 Eastern. Well, and let's be clear. This was, this was sent to me. Um, I'll keep this person anonymous. Um, but the game did, and if you had cable, the game did end up starting on ESPN2. That was where I saw the start of the game. Let me just read to you ESPN2 programming. So let okay. So my point is, fine. You're not going to put it on ESPN. Put it on ESPN2 and have the but stream then they start. Compete on, with themselves. Why would they but, do that for the? But wait, but wait. Here's the programming that was on ESPN2. A 30 for 30, this is from 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on. A 30 for 30, a re-air from 2018. E60, a docu-series show on fighting training camps. The NCAA softball selection show. The softball tournament analysis show. Cornhole re-air from yesterday. And the X Games Japan re-air from earlier today. Same start time for this repeat. And hockey. Sarah, when you hear that and when you hear about just giving a game a platform, what say you? It's just also crazy that it went from the um, hockey game to the X game Japan. And it would, there was no instruction on what to do next, where to go next, yeah. like what Even I a had to do. on the bottom, right? Even if they're not yeah. going to say it, flash on the bottom, watch this game on ESPN after the break. It's like, I work in hockey and I should know, and I don't even know this. How is a casual right. fan going to be like, okay, this is where I flip right now. And then, especially with the way Twitter has been messed up by Elon with the algorithm and the timing and everything. Now it's you, if you're on ESPN, you have to make it clear. These are the things on where to go because you can't get your news on Twitter and know where to go from there anymore. So it's just like, it was a whole mess. And it's just like, I don't know. We love hockey on ESPN for the eyeballs and the new fans, but this wasn't how to do it. But that's the thing too. Like the NHL, it feels like is so okay. Resting on their heels with the idea that being on ESPN is what's going to drive eyeballs to them. Right. That is it. That's it. That was the whole idea of it. You don't need to do anything else. Let the game market itself. Let it be on ESPN. They have their own app, right? The ESPN doesn't give a shit if they get views on this. The viewership wasn't good for LA against Edmonton. It's not going to be good for Vegas against Edmonton on a 10 p.m. game. It's a Canadian team. They don't care. If this was New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, maybe they would. The NHL is the one with something to lose here because ESPN's deal is locked in place. The, The money's not going up because they get more viewership. The NHL has this app. It's called the NHL app. Maybe send a push notification Telling fans, yes. watch the game at 10 p.m. Eastern on ESPN, starting on ESPN2. Send a push notification. I know that's adding work to someone's plate, but if you oh, want it's on not the adding. Game, Come on. Exactly. That's like five seconds. Don't <laughs> you don't need a witty line. adding work. And listen, I am exhausted, uh-huh. but that is not yep. adding work. No, I just, it's so, it's so simple. So anyway, uh, we will watch this. Please read Shayna's story on this, on The Athletic. Um, it's a good uh, piece, just kind of outlining the impacts to growing the game and the impacts to just poor communication and poor decision making. But let's uh, let's turn to the actual hockey happening around the hockey world. Sarah, it's time for your favorite segment. What is it? Bit O News. Bit O News, my friends. And this happened before our last episode, but Sarah and Shayna were carrying the workload because I flaked and I was bizarre training, training, my God, traveling. <laughs> Game seven, baby. Woo! <laughs> God, my mind is exhausted. Um, the Flyers have announced that they have a new president of hockey operations, and that is now former broadcaster Keith Jones. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to say that I thought this was an interesting choice. But, you know, as more and more became clear that Briere was going to be the GM and that it was going to be Briere who would be making a lot of the decisions, you can see how this has to be someone who's comfortable with taking on this job, knowing they're not going to be the person steering the ship. And it certainly seems to be good when you talk about the whole PR front of, yay, former Flyer player, this whole new orange thing, whatever. Um, But Sarah, do you like this choice? And what is your read on how, if at all, this helps the Flyers going forward? Um, I honestly, I'm always going to be team more innovation, better. I I don't know. I think there is a larger pool to pick from here. I do like him. 
I really do like him as a person. Um, and I thought this was kind of an interesting hire, right? Because he's from the broadcast side. Like you don't see that every day. You know what? I'm a little bit curious to see how it goes. I don't want to totally shit on this, but I do think there were better options that would go better to complement what they already have. You know what I mean? Like maybe, I mean, I'm beating the analytics drum, of course, but Tolsky is from Philadelphia. I don't know if he wanted the job or not, but that would have been kind of a full circle moment for them that also complemented who they do already have. But I'll hear him out. I'll hear him out. I'll let him cook. Dana, did you like this call or no? And if so, why? Um, I don't hate it because I like, look, we're the first people to scream, bring someone new in. It doesn't yeah. need to be the same people over and over again. Is it a former player with no experience? Sure. Could, are they going to hope maybe that he becomes their own Joe Sackick or something like that? Maybe. It's not like it's the worst choice in the world. Like it, there, there could be some potential here. And like you said, it had to be someone that was willing to work with what was already in place around him. I think the risk is that you have two inexperienced people. I don't think mm. many teams would really go for that generally. So that... I, I guess credit to them because I wouldn't I wouldn't expect the Flyers to go for inexperience. I did expect them to go for a former player and find that middle ground. But <laughs> why not? Like Keith Jones isn't he's not an idiot. You know, like it's not like this is someone who just comes out clamoring with bad takes either. This is someone who has taken risks before. Even he was his own agent at points. Not that he did he even said like he didn't do a great job, but like <laughs> to me, it's like I wonder if he learned from that. Was like, oh let me let me school myself on the business side. Like I don't know the answer to it. I'd be really curious if someone could find that out. But maybe there is something there that he had a cool plan and wants to bring this team into the future a little bit. He's not the most old school person in the world on a broadcast either. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, to be clear, let's remind everyone who didn't already have it drilled into their brain that this was the president of hockey ops role, which often is viewed as someone who manages up while the GM manages down. So this is a lot of um, PR to the public and PR to ownership and doing translation of the message and maintaining buy-in. So for all those points. And that, that message, it's a message is something that orange. <laughs> I like going to their it's Twitter new. in the header. It's new. Yeah. It's orange. It's, it's just orange like. and white. It has the whole situation has made me think of the way every team is structured. Like what if, like I know in Carolina, Don Waddell is the president and GM. Correct. What if that started changing and you give somebody else an extra opportunity? I mean, that's obviously your, it's more expensive. So I see why a team like Carolina would But it's checks and balances in a way Yeah, too, exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, but it's also, it's also, I think it's also in a way, I do think a president of hockey operations is a better if you're going to go big in front office, I think that's a better role for a former player, like Shana was saying, because you may not have the business acumen yet to understand how to, or the, honestly, the actual, like what is required to evaluate players when you're running a team perspective, like you can see it, but you have to learn how to record it and evaluate it and analyze it and make sure you're getting enough sample and all of that. Like it could be a really nice way to softly enter into this space and see if it's a fit versus just saying, Hey, you're a GM now. Congratulations. You played the game. Um, all right, let's move on y'all. I'd like to say this is the last time for a while, but I can't say that because you know, it always happens and it happens time and time again. Shana, what time is it? Time for how does this affect the leaves? And I am upset. I didn't do it before, but there is a way to tie in the, uh, broadcasting drama with the leaves because well, the leaves, what, sorry, what? No. So I was, I was with, I, Jeff Merrick was kind enough to have me on his show today. This is Monday. And I, my time got moved because of the Leafs oh postseason availability. And oh I told God. Matt Marchese, I said, Matt, I'm coming on your show and I'm going to make a, how does this affect the Leafs joke? And he said, he supported it. So I did do that. So it, it, it's, it's literally in my own backyard now, people. Yeah, we need it. But so the broadcasting drama, the Leafs, didn't get their Saturday night, which no one was happy about. Of course, Sportsnet would want that in the U.S. The broadcast, it seem you're like, saying. What? You're the broadcast, you're saying. Yeah, they didn't yes. They didn't get to play on Saturday night. Sportsnet would have wanted that as the broadcast on a Saturday night. Who among us? In, you know, in Canada, that drives views. I think the U.S. was picking. I think the U.S. networks got more of a hand in picking which went where with arena availability in mind. So the Leafs got screwed just like the Oilers. Everybody hates Canada's well, they, teams. Well, you know, there would have been an easy way for them to control that. Maybe it was win more, but who am I to say? <laughs> um, anyway, so y'all, let's let's go right to it. Um, the narratives are so many. Um, the Leafs are out. The Leafs are destroyed. Um, there is a controversial no-goal call, which 
back to the broadcast was bungled because if you weren't listening to the full broadcast, you didn't really understand what was happening in terms of what was being shown. And it sounds like that's the same case in the arena too, is that they were showing highlights, not showing and implying and communicating when stoppages were signaled. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Florida comes back to win it. Nick Cousins with the game winner. Uh, Matthew Kachuk, our boy, friend of the pod, <laughs> continues to make fun of We Want Florida. The Florida Panthers are actually selling a We Want Florida t-shirt, which is- Oh my God, and that's fucking and delightful. If anyone from the Panthers is listening, I will take a small, Sarah, what size would you like? Um, extra large, we're doing it big. Shayna? I'll go for a small as well. We're, we're just tr- we're throwing summer. it into oh. the universe. Who's to say? Who's to say? Um, no goals for Austin Matthews in this series. There was no addressing the team by head coach Sheldon Keith. They are, again, we record on Monday, so they are- talking at some point, perhaps exactly while we were recording this, Austin Matthews of has, they are. of course, Austin Matthews has come out in his postseason interviews and said he wants to stay with the Leafs. Let's talk about the game first. After not allowing themselves to be swept, the Leafs are out round two. In terms of the actual hockey that was played, Shayna, did Toronto deserve a better fate or did they do this to themselves? What are the key ingredients that went into Toronto losing this series as a whole? I think it's fair to say like there were games that the Leafs deserved better in this. I think in round one, the Leafs didn't deserve better and they got the bounces. Um, there were games that the Leafs definitely deserved to lose in round one and they managed to come back in those key minutes of the game and do things that they hadn't before. Against the Panthers, I think it was game three maybe that they should have won but didn't were the better team but didn't have the results and then they started tweaking things when they probably shouldn't have um do I think that they should have advanced no they weren't the better team and it wasn't goaltending which I think is really important because anyone could say but their goalie was hurt. goalie goaltending wasn't the problem it honestly was the same problem they've had in the regular season it's finishing finishing your chances and guys like you know Marner and Matthews and Tavares were generating shots and chances without the goals to show for it. That's a problem. Sarah, we mentioned already that Matthews doesn't have a goal in this series. Bob, uh, we glossed over it, but a little bit more should be said about how significant Bob Rofsky's performance was. And now, of course, to Shana's point, the narrative coming out of these exit interviews, Ryan O'Reilly says, quote, they were more physical than us and it went their way. I feel like that is such a tired, with all due respect to Ryan O'Reilly, I feel like that's such a tired, lazy excuse for what happened in the series. What is your take on what went into Florida being able to come away with the win? I understand O'Reilly saying that, and I'd like to hear the question asked to make him say that, honestly, because I do think point. he's talking about his own role. Right. He's saying, oh, maybe I should have been a little more tougher to play against, which to be fair to him, he was actually I mean, at least in the first round, he was really, really good in what they needed. But I think he played his role fine and it wasn't about him, but he can't just come up here and start shitting on Austin Matthew. Yeah, I think our stars needed to score more goals. So I think sometimes I do need to read between the lines more with a situation like that. But I don't think it came down to that. I do think it was, like Shana said, the finishing and the lack of scoring that you see every year when they couldn't go past the first round. And it's the core four showing up for like one game this series, not really showing up. I know, like, I, I do think they were generating shots and stuff, but what is what does that mean? How, how does that affect the Leafs? It doesn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, where do we go from here? We know there are a lot of decisions that we will break down in more detail, but just very quickly, Shayna, where do you think changes come first for the Leafs? Just give a one word answer. We'll explore all this more in the off season. Coaching, front office, or roster for Toronto? Coaching. Sarah? Coaching. There we go. All right, my friends. Well, we'll see if we get a break from how does this affect the Leafs, but I fear that they just won't There's leave gonna us There's going to be alone. a rule change now because of that one yeah. goal. This is, can, I was watching the game and I'm like, I'm fine. If you're going to say that goal doesn't count, which I didn't agree with, whatever. I did not want that to be like the difference making goal. I was so right. glad the Leafs scored again because you don't want that to be the narrative. We got screwed and that's why we lost. But like... Like now I'm waiting for it. We're going to see like calls for rule changes for this and that because it hurt the Leafs. Like, well, it's going to be too much. The narrative is already some reason the NHL wanted the Panthers and the Hurricanes to right. be the ECS. Yeah. The revenue is literally through the roof. Through was, the roof. And I heard like, that during Rangers Devils too. Like they want the Rangers. 
they want like nobody cares nobody cares no one's fixing games for results the Leafs would be a perennial Stanley Cup finalist if that were the case take the L hold the L in your hands and just leave us alone (laughs) yeah so I, I thought that was a goal too and also honest to God like men please stop responding to me and explaining to me what happened I know what happened. I was reacting. It was a reacting tweet or you're two not allowed to have out. feelings and emotions about oh, it. You have gosh, to be like very exhausting. stoic and explain it. But anyway. every potential thought and angle must be spelled out in a fucking 240 character tweet. Anyway, let's continue in the East because Florida's opponent, as Sarah already said, is the Carolina Hurricanes who take care of the upstart New Jersey Devils, who again, we feel like is just going to be a story more and more exciting for years to come. Um, Unfortunate end to this one where a delay of game penalty in OT gives Carolina the skater advantage. Now they were, they had played in my opinion, a better series overall. And again, the series ends four one. So it's not like this was the end all be all of plays, but it's just a a yucky way for a series and a game to have to end Um, a power play goal by the hurricanes wins it. Um, there's now talk too that Tavo Teravainen may be back. Uh, Sarah, first, before we get to maybe some help back on the forward side of the ice for Carolina, when we went into the series, all three of us were really concerned. They were broken. They were battered. They were beat up. We didn't know if they could sum up the effort to make it through this second round series, but they do and they win. What stood out to you about how the Hurricanes did it? Yeah, just that it, there are no passengers. I mean, Jordan fucking Martin, he had... Ended that series with the most points in one series from a Hurricane player in history. I just think that is hilarious. But it also, it shows he's a hard worker and that there is depth on this team. That has never been the issue. The, the issue is always the star power. But I guess if there's enough people buying into the system, it sometimes doesn't matter. I was thoroughly impressed with their performance against the Devils. I thought Freddie Anderson was good in net and we'll see where it he takes them in the ECF, but with Tara Vinen, he broke his hand and it was kind of like his thumb area. And Tyler Bertuzzi did the same thing and returned to play a month after his surgery. And he got the same surgery as Tara Vinen. And now yesterday, I think would have been a month since Tara Vinen got the surgery. So I think people are speculating, oh, is he going to be ready? Whatever. And Tara Vinen said himself, I was a little surprised the doctor cleared me, but I'm fine. Feels fine everything's fine. So he's going to be back. He's had kind of a rough season with the hurricane. So I don't know if we can expect him to jump in and be this like amazing playmaker that he has been his whole career. It might take him a little while and they've been doing fine without him. Maybe that gives him a little confidence and he gets back to the, they have to put him back on the line with Aho. I think like that, like you got to get him out there and get his confidence up, especially with the season he's had. And like the benefit, I mean, if there is one of having a hand injury, and I believe I saw reports, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but he has been skating. So yeah, you're able to keep up your cardio strength. You're able to keep up your physical yeah. strength um, while you just rehab a hand. And I think that, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. That's a great point, but he's never cared. Like he is always the last one at the end of sprints. And he, one time I remember during training camp, he purposely was going slow and giving the trainer a hard time. And then he put his stick over the line. He was the last one. And he's like, I'm done. But he is so young and so like he just has always had this stamina but you can't just go into to your point you can't just go into playoff hockey like that but he is kind of lazy and that's what I love about him (laughs) all right well let's flip to the other side of of this matchup and Shayna again I think most people while of course New Jersey would want to go farther no one's counting this as a big loss for New Jersey they've really impressed this season in a lot of different ways Are there areas of their game that did concern you in this series? And overall, how opportunistic are you about what they're going to be able to do next year, the year after that, the year after that? Yeah, like I feel like this Devils team set the bar higher for themselves by finishing as high as they did in the regular season. And that's totally okay. And like, I think they'll be fine. Um, The fact that they made it through round one, I think is a huge win. The fact that they were in round two is like, it's that's important that's progress because when you look at the big picture it's the turnaround like don't forget where they were last year and it was hard to see any signs of progress around that goaltending the worst you know combination of I think seven goalies the numbers were awful every game fell out of hand and it didn't matter what happened in front of the net you couldn't see the progress unless Jack Hughes was doing something like it was a wreck so I think this is this was a big year this is a big stepping stone 
But from here, it's it's so important because you have to take the right lessons out of losing. It can't be our rush based scheme didn't work. Now we got to get, you know, panicking, slow it down. It's how do we add more versatility? How do we get better at our own game now that we have the confidence, now that we know to kind of stick with it? So if a team like the Carolina Hurricanes who have that experience, not aggressive four check and, you know, suffocating defense comes around, we know how to work around that and we know how to adjust. That's a big step, but it's going to be interesting for them because they have a ton of free agents. You have Meyer and Bratt, who are both restricted free agents, and I think they need both of them. You have on defense, Severson and Ryan Graves are, you know, UFAs. You have Tatar up front and, and players like depth players that are UFAs. Like, it's going to be an interesting offseason because they can pay their stars and then use entry-level talent like a Luke Hughes to balance it out. For me, the area I think they still have to focus on is goaltending because – they don't have certainty in net. And that was fine in the regular season. They got away with, you know, slightly above average goaltending because the team was so good in, at protecting their net. But in the postseason, it was a problem. They didn't get a single quality start until game five in net against the Carolina Hurricanes. That's not good. You know, Vanacek, you have to figure out, was it the fact that he never played this big of a workload? And that's what weighed him down. It's totally possible. Goalies have to adjust to playing as much as they did and kind of just saw that in the regular season. Should they have like leaned off of him down the stretch instead of focusing on trying to move up the standings? Like maybe that's totally possible. Um, is it Kier Schmidt, the goalie of the future? They have to figure that out too. Or do they need someone for a couple years? Should they make a big swing? Go for it. Try to get a Gibson or a Helen Buck or something really wild from a team that is rebuilding or, you know, can they stay the status quo for another year? Like I really don't know, but that I think is the biggest challenge for them to figure out. And then everything else they can, you know, keep in place. Yeah, we're going to have to do more on goalies once things start to <clears throat> narrow down this postseason and off because I regretted to mention too, Samsonov has come out and said he had a neck injury and, you know, he goes out too. And it's just been, I feel like it's been one of the most inconsistent postseasons in terms of goaltenders that there's been in a while. Yeah. Um, yep. And then Bobrovsky enters the chat. Right, exactly. Like the only one. <laughs> exactly. I'm, and I'm so curious about him because we know patterns from his, if he starts X number of games in a row, his game tends to fade, like things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, how does he keep up? Is it the fact that he was rested going into it? The only legit starter, right, in round two of all the high-end starters was Jake Ottinger, and he has turned into a pumpkin. Yeah. Like, what What is happening? And it's not like just Durkin was the reason or Sorokin was the reason their teams got eliminated, but they still got eliminated. Yep. Yeah. And, it's and it's kind of flipping the narrative, right? Yeah, exactly. Goalies aren't stealing a series. Now what? After exactly. a year, <laughs> and it's crazy too, after a year where you had the Avalanche win and they got below average goaltending pretty much the entire postseason. Yep, yep. And it's going to be interesting too because, you know, speaking as someone who was covering a team still in it who did go seven games, I mean, we've had no rest. It's been literally every other day except for one two-day break that still involved traveling from Dallas to Seattle, which is literally the longest fucking flight in the world. But um, it's going to be interesting because it sounds like initial reports, and probably by the time this hits your ears, we will know definitively the schedule for the East and West Coast uh, finals. But George Richards, who does a tremendous job covering the Florida Panthers, uh, did tweet out today on Monday that he is hearing that Panthers and Canes will start Thursday, Saturday. So that's a tremendous amount of rest for Bob, and it's a tremendous amount of rest for both teams. And I think, I actually think it's good by the league to give teams some rest going into this. If you want to maintain a high level of hockey, you can't keep going like this, in my opinion. D Sarah, how important is rest going to be? Let's start with the East. How important is rest going to be for those two teams? It's time for a new narrative, rest versus rust, which is the, mo the worst narrative ever. No, you always want, I mean, well, you look at the Panthers going, clawing their way into hey. the postseason, and it's like, well, maybe you don't need too much rest, but I think this isn't too much rest. It's like a week, and everyone's still – like, this is where training um, really, like you were saying, with Tara Vinen comes in, and as many days as you can get an impact player back to health, the more – the better. It's just like – it's kind of silly to argue against that, even though – there is something to be said about keeping in shape, but that's like you're a professional athlete, like act like it, go keep in shape. <laughs> Dana, do you like the rest or would you, are you fearing the rust? Um, I think that rest is good to an extent. It's not like they're getting a week off. You're getting two days mm -hmm. off, right? Like it's not as big of a deal. And with these- it's a huge teams, deal, wait, let me tell you. It is a huge deal. I mean, yeah. 
it, it seems like it, it just I think it it puts more onus on the training staff too to keep everyone in game shape how do you do that and I think that there's something to learn from that too because how often do we see teams on a layoff and then they come back and they don't know how to play hockey and like this might be an opportunity to go okay this is what works this is how we keep our players going like what what's the answer is it having a scrimmage in practice essentially on an off day if you have a three-day break that middle day you know to do it like I don't know the answer I'm not a fucking trainer I don't claim to be but I, I like I do wonder if there's something to kind of figure out that balance like if you can get healthier this time of year and have that extra day I think that's great if that helps someone like Tara Vine come back awesome if that helps someone like Bobrovsky great and the team like the Kraken they're gonna be fucking exhausted we yes. want good hockey we that's might why need you don't a breather I guess that's why like you don't go to seven. But... Right. Exactly. That's the yeah. that's the counter argument. But so this is this is now as I do quick math to keep me honest here, right? This will be a week for Carolina and six days for Florida off if it's Thursday, right? Because Florida oh my God. On Friday. I, I I like time is such a flat circle. I didn't even I I'm know. thinking three days. Say. When you said two days, I was like, Well, today's Monday and then it's gonna be <laughs> I Thursday. So I don't think that works. I can't keep track of anything anymore. It's, it's okay. so bad. Like believe me, I know. I literally have no idea where I am or what I'm supposed to I, I think I got up this morning. I if you told me it was 10 PM, I'd believe you, but who's to say? Um, all right, let's switch over to the West where we have two series to talk about. One is over, one will be over by the time this reaches your ears, but not by the time we talk about it. So let's talk about that decided one first. And we already mentioned the deciding game came Sunday. Uh, we've missed two games since we spoke with you. Last time we talked, we were talking about the suspensions, um, one on each side that was still being hotly debated, but the teams make it through that game five with Vegas coming away the winner, William Carlson having a dad energy game. And then in game six on Saturday, Sunday, my God, um, I really thought Edmonton would rally, particularly being at home and force a game seven, but they cannot make it happen. Three goals in three minutes to start that game six. I, I tweeted out, I said, boy, they really are trying to overcome the programming decisions by making this a thriller that you just can't miss. Ironically, people who only had ESPN did in fact miss it but here we are uh so uh Edmonton is out Vegas is in a continued impressive start for this franchise wall Dreisaitl was practically in tears in his post-game comments it was it was quite a sight to behold an interesting choice that came out of this that people are um what is it armchair quarterbacking today is of course the goaltending decisions by Edmonton and that is keeping Skinner in that over Campbell uh, Skinner, of course, is a finalist for the Calder, but didn't have a great postseason, particularly this series. Sarah, did you expect Edmonton to force a game seven, or is this what you suspected would happen in this series all along? No, I expect, expected them to win. Um, I know. I don't know. I, I think it's really hard to say what the reason was this. Like, I, I don't think it comes down to just goaltending. I don't know if Campbell would have been better than Skinner in this situation. I think it just might be the defense imploding once again. And it's just so difficult because they did have the echo home acquisition was great, but it just wasn't enough. And I think sometimes you just look back on a playoff run and realize for next season, okay, that wasn't enough. We have to do more. Shayna, there's always the narrative around big stars. We just talked about it with Toronto, but there's some big names on both sides of this game. We've talked about our beloved Mark Stone. Jack Eichel, of course, is in there. And then you have McDavid and Leon. Uh, what did you think the contributions were from the quote unquote stars on either side of this matchup? And was that part of the reason why Vegas comes away with the win? Yeah, I mean, like you look at that game and it's not. I don't blame it entirely on goaltending. I think it was too, like, are you finishing your chances enough, right? Like, that's part of the conversation. Jerry Seidel and McDavid were doing everything they could. Jack Eichel dominated in his minutes. Like, he was outstanding. He went up against Jerry Seidel more, and then they changed the lines to stack up because they separated them, rightfully so, to handle the matchups a little bit better, and it was working for them. But then they put them back together for that super line. I don't think they were the problem. I think that they worked their asses off all postseason. It's the guys around them that were disappointing. I don't blame someone like Hyman who was clearly yeah. injured, but Nugent Hopkins only had one goal and he really wasn't doing it on his own well enough. He was great with McDavid, but without him or without the power play, I don't think he showed up enough. Evander Kane played like shit the entire postseason. And he yeah. either got- Such a shame. Hate to see it. Such a shame, right? He was so focused on all like the extracurriculars and yes- 
having an edge. You can wake up your team and you can energize them, right? He was just undisciplined. And I think when you're undisciplined like that and not playing your game, it's a problem. If you can balance having the edge and playing well, like Matthew Kachuk, you're doing something right. But for him, it just felt like if you're not getting your way, you're going to be pissy. That's the vibe I got from him so often. He played with McDavid and Dry said all the times on the super line. He was the least valuable part of it. And obviously any player would be, but he wasn't even keeping pace with them enough, I felt like. When he was just with Dry Saddle, he didn't impress me. When he was just with McDavid, those are the players I look to going, your stars are doing everything they can. And the Golden Knights have figured out a way to slow down your stars this game. You need to surprise them with contributions elsewhere. It wasn't Yamamoto's best game. It was, And you can't look at them and go, well, they're the reason it's out. It's a combination of everything. And like you said, the defense. How come everybody besides Matias Ekholm forgot how to play defense this postseason? Like, yeah, what bad. happened there? That's that's a coaching problem, too. If the player, If you have the system, that's one thing. You need to find a way to adjust it so they learn how to execute it and support your goaltending. Mm. So... I get that argument, but I just think it was everything falling short. And let's not forget the opening games of the series, even the Oilers blowout, they were the worst team at five on five numerous times. If you can't win a game without your power play and it was game four that they had, they went over two on the power play and lost like that, that, that can't happen. I think the way Vegas played in game five, when they were defending their lead, was the biggest push to Edmonton. Like, if you want to win this series, you need to step the fuck up. Those last two minutes, the way they were just forcing turnovers, keeping play and cycling, that was the team that they had to prepare for. And it just feels like they didn't. Yeah, and, you know, to Shana's point, uh, Shana, Prashant, and I have been on this little power play journey in the postseason. And as we have talked about and predicted, the power play opportunities have continued to dry up as the rounds and the games have gone on. And Edmonton continued to be the team that was skewing our results to say, and it gets harder and harder to convert on them because Edmonton kept doing it. But it is true. uh, They have one power play opportunity in game six and they do not convert on it. So a tail of the tape. And we know that, right? We know power plays trend down as games go on in series. And I think Cam Sharon found it that if you're a team that converts on the power play a lot, you're not going to be the one to get the few opportunities when they come around. That's what I just said. I was echoing it adding to it we all agree (laughs) this i I think it's been fun though like how much we got to see with the power play in round one i wonder if it comes back around at all in round three like do you think power plays are dead after round two now that edmonton's gone no i I don't exactly i think it's gonna be like especially with we'll see the true value of rest exactly let's see if we get some skilled plays exactly and And the value of adjustments you have two series to study a penalty kill season well, and I will also say we we forgot to mention a player that I have loved and followed since um, he made his NHL debut um, is the artist formerly known as Jonathan Audi Marcheseau, who now just simply goes by Jonathan Marcheseau, but he does have a natural hat trick and and we've, we've all followed him in different ways, but I'm just really happy for him. He's a player I can easily get behind. I think that's a great part a short of- king. A short king. Mm-hmm. Him and Riley Smith popping king off spring, with, the, with the Panthers too. <laughs> Dale Talon punching air right now. Gerard Collant at home. It's too funny with Vegas and Florida. Like, I love it. That's the narrative I can get behind. Well, Columbus passed on him too. So it's not just, it's not just them. Yeah. All right. We have one more series to finish. And, and y'all might be thinking, hey, Allison, you kept track of who predicted what last round. I did. But we can't go back and see how we actually did on those predictions until all the series are done. So we're going to do that next episode. One series awaits. It's a series that ends with game seven Monday night at some time. I don't even know. Central division is my central time is my nightmare. I really have no clue what time anything is when it is based is out it, of central. I think time. it's 8 p.m. Eastern. Right? Yes, that's it correct. 7 5 p.m. Pacific. Day. 5 p.m. Pacific. Let yeah. me just tell you, P.S., by the way, when you are local and a game starts at 8 30, that's some bullshit. That is not a good start time. Minnesota locally. and Dallas were anything. screaming about it in round one because they it's were terrible. always at 8 30 local time. So it's we terrible. got the vibes are just off. You're like, what time do I start my routine? Exactly. And like you look at your watch when the game is over, and game one went to overtime. And I looked at my watch, I'm like, it's 12 30. I want mm-hmm. to die. Like mm-hmm. it's just, it just is crazy. Anyway, um, we are here talking about all of this because the Seattle Kraken with their backs up against the wall going into game six at home when they have historically been a better road team come all the way back and in a definitive statement in game six, win the game six, three, forcing a game seven, going against a coach with the longest 
game seven win streak in Pete DeBoer. He is, I believe, seven and oh, six and oh, six and oh, and against Jake Ottinger, who sub subtle narrative here has been pulled now for the second time this series, but is also 33 and oh after coming back from a loss in regulation. So there's a lot of narratives. There's a lot of themes you could pull from this. The Kraken actually, some might suggest, I don't know the reason why, uh, simulated a bit of a road game before the home game six by staying as a team in a hotel and then coming to Climate Pledge to play. But this has continued to be one of the most wild, but also bizarre because I, as we've talked about, the score, in my opinion, does not reflect what's going on in these games. It's so ping pongy back and forth game to game. I literally don't know what to think going into this game seven Sarah, what are the vibes? What are you looking for in this game seven tonight? The vibes are chaos. I've always had Kraken in seven and they were spotted by Piper Shaw in the locker room this morning, listening to wide open spaces by the Dixie Chicks. So, or the Chicks now. So I love the vibes. The vibes are chaos as they have always been for this Kraken team. And as they have been throughout this series. And that's the beauty of a game seven. Sometimes there's no more fucking analysis to do. Sometimes you literally just have to get on the ice and see what happens. And that is really the vibe headed into this game. Dana, what has stood out to you from either or both teams, good and or bad, going into a game seven? Who do you give the edge to tonight? I really don't know. Like, I'm I'm so torn on this one. And like, granted, I didn't watch game six close oh! enough. I watched it. Dana. I was drunk. Watch the game. I watched it. Did you buy any jerseys? <laughs> I didn't. You know what's funny? I was going to. I did buy two slip, slip and slides for oh! slip and flip. <laughs> I'm coming because over. we have to have a slip and flip tournament where you have to like do slip and slide, do around a flip cup, run back, tag the next person in. I've been trying oh to gosh. manifest this for a while and I got drunk enough that I'm like, this is happening out here with the measuring tape. But oh I can watch the game. I saw the goals, but like my brain didn't fully capture everything. I'll be honest. This is you've literally wounded my soul. Okay. okay, go ahead. It's, finish your analysis. Fine. I'm here Listen, for it. Tell me. The go vibes ahead. though seemed very good for Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> they were scoring goals we were yelling for them we're having a great time we watched the game but I'm just I saying know. my brain didn't you know calculate numbers in my head or something during it that was turned off um you know I, I think the thing with Seattle is we've seen them with their backs against the wall a little bit like they didn't face they faced elimination and they were able to extend series and we've seen it where here's a chance to close out and they did like it they played really well, though. I don't think it matters. They're playing differently than we expect anyone to. We don't expect them to be this high-scoring team. And then look at them last game. Like, it's 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 so hard to project. And I think everybody hates Philip Grubauer and doesn't want to give him an ounce of credit, even though, like, look at what he's doing this postseason, too. He's been excellent. And I think he's a huge reason why that penalty kill is clicking. But there is something about... You. What? That's a good note by you. Yeah, I know. I, I Someone does really good work, and I can just, like learn from it who knew who knew someone covers the Kraken really well um but like the stars are a team like I have a hard time counting them out because like look at Joe Pavelski the way he steps up in these moments like look at Rupe Hans look at Miro Haskin and if Ottinger can be steady enough in that I think we really might have a close game and that's what I'm hoping for right this series to me pales in comparison to Avs Kraken that to mm -hmm. me was one of the best <laughs> series of the playoffs and this one isn't hitting those notes yet if we can get a close game to like end it out that'll be really interesting because I want it that it's hard fought and we don't see score effects and the calls are the reason like I just want it to be a close game I just don't think that's what we're going to get necessarily but I do want to see how you know Yanni Gord matches up against Jason Robertson who I don't think has been good enough this series and I want to see how Ottinger rebounds against someone like Grubauer who everyone counts out versus the goalie everyone expects to be good like I I like that aspect of it all right well we will see we'll break that one down a little bit more it's been a lot of uh subtle performances where the team or the player that maybe doesn't get on the score sheet isn't necessarily the one with the underlying behavior that is bad so it's going to be really really interesting as long as my heart survives to make it through and find out who advances on to see vegas in the western conference final i seriously though Yes, I think it'll be so funny to <laughs> see so many Canadians fucking punching air. If it's they Vegas versus are. Seattle, I, I know. know. But if it's I, here and like we were talking about the timing, the timing is going to be fucked up for one team, no matter what, if it's Dallas against Vegas because of the different time zones. And if it's Seattle versus Vegas and the league still gives them like the fuck you button every day. And it's like, here's 8 p.m. Eastern because now we want you in a national spot. It's going to be even funnier. But like 
it's gonna suck it's not gonna be funny but you know what I mean like it's just gonna add to the narrative but like if it's the two expansion teams like there's so many cool narratives there but then you could have a rematch of 2020's Western Conference Final with Dallas Vegas like I think it's cool but everyone's gonna be whining that it's not a Canadian team so it's so fucking stupid I'm about to write about this today so look out for my article on it tomorrow it's just like where can I we find your article on get bleacherreport.com slash La, 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 whatever there's a bunch <laughs> of numbers the bleacher report app you'll find it um it's literally the stupidest discourse i've ever seen in my life none of it is making any sense and we're it's just it's it's, it's like the canes panther stuff ever can you can we forget for a second that the ratings don't like the well, deal's done you're not making more money on this just and why would you want to enjoy. rig it to do anything like, do you want to rig it to the Canadian teams? Just cry about not winning a cup, okay? Or like just you try said, to enjoy win, win these more. Win and more. enjoy these environments. Like, take think of Nashville in what 2017, their road to the Stanley Cup final. Everybody got to see what an amazing market it was. Try to open your minds and see how fucking cool Seattle is in their home games and mm-hmm. and how much fun the Canes are having. Like, just relax. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see what these series bring us. We're going to wrap up our episode as we always do with our favorite game which is fuck, marry, kill. And as we've been doing, we're going to go through the major award finalists. Sarah, as is tradition, you're going to be up first. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, we're going to do the Norris, historically awarded to the best defenseman in the NHL, whatever that means, depending on the day. Here are your three finalists. The Rangers, Adam Fox, San Jose Sharks, Eric Carlson, and the Avalanches, Kale McCarr, the floor is yours. I am marrying Eric Carlson. I know it's kind of a hot take around here, but I think until there's two trophies that's the best defensive defenseman and the best offensive defenseman, I'm looking at who is the best player who was a defenseman who most impacted their team. And for me, personally, we can disagree. For me, that was Eric Carlson this year. It doesn't matter. Like at a certain point when you're scoring so much, it doesn't really matter. Like to me, anything else. I think he was just otherworldly in that realm. And that to me is enough to consider him the best defenseman of the year. I am going to fuck Adam Fox. I thought his five on five play this year was just outstanding. And that matters to me when I'm evaluating a defenseman. I am going to kill Kale McCarr. No tea, no shade. We love you, best friend of the pod. This is like such a stacked year for the Norris that there's even more people that like Brent Burns, like we like we can't even kill him because he's not on the radar. So Makar, you're on the radar enough to be killed. But it just, it wasn't his best season. Uh, not to say that that is his worst season, but I think there's, we're going to see better of him. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Shayna, how do you follow that? Yeah, I like all of your points, and like, I, I I have a hard time with this one. I view it as the best all around defenseman. I think you have to be the best two way defenseman. I think for Carlson, I'm so I'm gonna kill Carlson. Let me start like this. I am thrilled for Eric Carlson. I love Eric Carlson. For me, what he's doing is MVP worthy. I think it's the same discussion that there was with Roman Yossi last year. I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's why I'm so thrilled that he's up for the Ted Lindsay. And I think I married him winning it. I want him to win that award and get something because he deserves it this year. For this award, it doesn't do it for me. The penalty killing, the defense, I'm all about all the offense, but it's not enough. I will fuck Kale McCarr. He missed 20 games. This is my biggest thing. But in his minutes, he was the best defenseman. If he didn't, if he missed 10 games, he'd be my number one pick without a doubt in my mind, because I think he was that good in his minutes. Um, And I do expect more from him too. It's just because we know he's that good. I will marry Adam Fox. Yes, I'm biased. Give me whatever fucking shit you want. I went through this award with every number, every everything. If you want best all around, which I think this award is, I think it's him and Hampus Lindholm, but we don't have Lindholm because people didn't give him the credit. And Lindholm has more support than Fox. For me, Fox is it this year. The five on five play, the way he transitioned from offense to defense, I think he rated high enough in each category to bring the all around look together. But it would, there's so many good players this year. I, I love the discussion about defense because there's so many good players. Well, I am going to agree with you, Shayna. And the own, but my, I'm putting a little more emphasis on the Makar injuries. Um, that's the only reason I'm not marrying him, uh, just because he, of these three, is the one that stood out to me. And while I, Therefore, Adam Fox is fucked and I have to kill Eric Carlson because we love Eric Carlson, but I feel like this performance was skewed so heavily on offensive performance that we just can't do it. So 
there we are. All right, my friends, we thank you for hanging out with us for this episode. When we come back, we will know who are the final four teams standing are in the fight for the Stanley Cup. We'll go through rankings and we'll go through some other hot topics that we have on our wait list to bring to your ears. In the meantime, you can connect with us on social. We are at two underscore much underscore man on both Instagram and Twitter. We would still love to see your boots on the ground videos wherever you are watching the game. Let us know what the vibes are. And if you're wearing too many men merch, you may get entered in a drawing for a prize. And if you don't have too many men merch, it is time to go get it. Go to too many men merch.com, get hats, sweatshirts, t-shirts, switch cases, notepads, watch bands, anything your little heart desires. And until we talk again, we ask that you each please do something, no matter how ma- how big or small, to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Love you. Bye.